Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. You want to make sure God knows you? What, what's, okay, what's the greatest commandment? Remember they tested Jesus, that attorney? What's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus says, how does it read to you? Um, Deuteronomy, he quotes, good attorney. He says, it says, um, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. And the second is like unto the first, right? You should love your neighbor as what? As yourself. Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus said, you, you spoke well. Go, go and do it. You'll live. And he, wishing to be justified, said, and who is my neighbor? That's where we get the parable of the Good Samaritan. The one who shows mercy to those that other people say are not worthy of mercy or desi the less desirables. We have to love God first. And then we have to love our fellow man. And uh, when it comes to God knowing you, if you don't love him, he says, I don't know you. I mean, he didn't even say you had to go to Bible college. You don't even have to memorize verses. All you have to do is love God. And God says, I know that one. Ha show of hands, how many of you love God? Better get every hand up. Get them up high here. I'm going to make sure you're all in. See, because he's going to say someday, I saw that. You love me. When you say, I love God, which personally, I love God. I had no shame in saying, I love God, because I found out how much he loved me. And it, it's one of those things you just can't help but respond when you know how much you're loved. We were, we were created for love. In fact, we respond really well to love, don't we? A lot better than threats. A lot better than fear. The devil uses fear to motivate people. Hate. Oh, they're powerful motivators, but love is a greater motivator. Love can get you up to do something, and, and it doesn't even have had any bad side effects on your blood pressure and your heart rate. And your. I always joke, being raised Sicilian, I can get someone to move out of a chair, even if they don't want to. I've learned Sicilian ways. Certain threats, they will get up. Now, I'm not saying that it would be, you know, like they're going to like me anymore after that. And I'm not, I'm just telling you they, they, their heart rate might like skip a few beats. And they might, um, you know, they might have a heart attack on me if I don't do it with a little bit of pizzazz, you know, tact. But, but there are ways to get people to move. But there's a better way to get person to move if you do it with love. See, in love, you can say to someone, hey, I, I need you. Could you get up out of the chair for a minute? I need some help over here. I'm going to go help that person. Could you help me? And they'll get up and help you out of love, and they won't have any high blood pressure or stress or anything because love is the motivator. We must love the Lord so he knows us. Now, Paul, Paul knows this. He hasn't even got to this. This is way down the road yet, okay? He hasn't told them that one yet. But what he is telling them is, you guys got a problem. You've divided Christ into little pieces. And you're not really giving him the, the, the spot of the, you know, he's the whole pie, not us. You don't say, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm a, you, you weren't baptized into Paul. You're baptized into Christ. Now, remember, we just studied Romans. But for those of you that weren't with us like three years ago when we were in Romans 6, I joke. It was a while ago. It took a while to go through Romans. But turn with me to Romans 6. I asked Dan to read this because he's going to be baptized today. And just for, for those of you that have heard me teach this, I want to challenge you today. Do you live this part of Romans? Because this part of Romans, what we're going to look at here, I, just, I didn't have time to review it with Dan, so I thought I'd just do it with you all publicly. Now, some of you, you've, you've been in Christ a long time, and you know this portion of Scripture. And you tell me how much... Does it hurt to revisit this truth for our faith? Because when it comes to baptism, I know there are some 
sects that say you must be baptized to be saved. Now, believe me, the scripture does teach an assurance of salvation when you are baptized. Because it says, repent and be baptized, and ye shall be what? Saved. But what about the thief on the cross? Did he get off the cross and get baptized? Did he go on missions? Did he wear holy underwear? Oh, you laugh, right? I had three and a half years in the Mormon church. It was mandatory. If you wanted to get into the highest heaven, you had to, you had to tithe 10% plus. You had to be married in the Mormon church. You had to go on missions. You had to do all these things. And there was 10 different steps you had to do to assure your salvation. I can't find them in the Bible. I got thrown out of the Mormon church eventually. I was one of their star students in the group. I was studying. I made the mistake of memorizing the Book of Mormon. Then I memorized the Pearl of Great Price. They have different books that they call their holy books, the Book of Mormon. And so they were smaller, so I thought I would start with them, and then they also carried the Bible. But it was a Bible, a Joseph Smith edition, one where Joseph Smith actually took the Bible, and verses he didn't like, he cut out. And then he reprinted the Bible without those verses. You know, the ones that say, like, if a husband, uh, it, or if a man aspires to be an overseer in the church, he must be the husband of how many wives? One. He didn't like that verse. He cut it out. It's not in the, book of Mo in the, in the, in the Mormon edition of the Bible. Any verses he didn't like, he just cut them out. Now, I wouldn't want to be him standing before God on Judgment Day because... What's the scripture say at the end of Revelation? He who takes away from this book or he who adds to this book shall receive how many of the plagues of this book? Oh, not a good idea. Do not mess with God's word. Okay, but they did. And they added a bunch of rules that said you must do these things to be saved. Yet Jesus had a thief on a cross next to him. And the one thief on the other side was mocking him, saying, if you're the son of God, why don't you get down off this cross and save yourself? And while you're at it, save us too, because it's really uncomfortable. And the other thief says, shut up. We are guilty. We deserve what's happening to us. This man has done nothing. He's innocent. Here's a guilty man recognizing his own guilt of his sin and yet recognizing that there is nothing that Christ did that was wrong. And so he turns to Jesus and says, And please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what was Jesus' words to that thief? He said, Today, this day, you shall be in where? Paradise, paradise with me. How many believe that that man went to be in paradise with Jesus? Yeah. I mean, we got it on good authority. Jesus said, right? He's going to. I love this part of the Bible. There's not one verse in this book that is not there for a reason. If people would just study the book, they would have the answer to give to those people who try to add extra steps to getting saved. When they say, you must join our church, you must be baptized into our church's name, you must go on missions for our church, you must give your money to our church, you must do whatever thing they add. And believe me, there's different groups that add different things. You must eat this certain way. You must do this certain thing. I don't care what they add. If they don't stick to the truth of the gospel, which is so simple, that all it takes is a man to acknowledge that he's a sinner and that Christ was sinless and say to the one who's sinless, please remember me. Call on the name of the Lord, it says, and ye shall be what? Saved. It doesn't say, go do all these other things to get saved. It just says, call on the Lord. That's all the thief was doing on the cross. It's that simple. And Paul, look at what Paul was saying here. He says, guys, keep your finger in Romans 6. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm sorry, I'll be there in just a second. 1 Corinthians, he says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but he sent me to preach the gospel. Not in cleverness of speech. That the cross of Christ would somehow be made void. So you don't have to be a fancy speaker to point people to Jesus. Now here, when he writes to the church at Rome, 
we see what true baptism is about. Verse 1 of Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace might increase? God forbid. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us that have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his what? His death. Raise your hand if you've been baptized into Christ. Man, am I preaching to the choir. Okay. All of us that have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. Pay attention now. This is one of the most freeing things I know to help believers. Young and old believers alike, if they can remember this message, watch what happens. Just, just a couple more verses. Let's look at this. He says, Therefore, since you've been baptized into his death, you are buried with him through baptism in, into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, then certainly we will be united with him in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. Knowing that the old, this, that the old self was crucified with him and that our, uh, in order that the, our body of sin, this old flesh tent that I'm in, he says in order that it might be done away with this thing is going to be, it's getting buried so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, every believer, I believe, needs to know this truth. Dan, this is for you today, that you know if you want to be freed from any bad habit, you want to be freed from any bondage, anything that has held you back, any hurt that someone has inflicted upon you, let me teach you this truth today from the gospel. As soon as you're joined to Jesus in these two things, in the likeness of his death and in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. You get to walk in newness of life. And you know why it works? Because the first part, joining him in the likeness of his death, when, when we take someone to the water to baptize them, we're symbolically taking them to a watery grave. We're going to lay them down and bury them symbolically. And everything that has had a, a hook, a, a, a fetter, a bond on, in their life, some power over them, as soon as you die, guess what happens to all those bad habits? I mean, I don't care if you're a chain smoker since you were the... Man, my mom chain smoked, my dad chain, and I just came out of the womb chain smoking. I don't know. And you, went, I, you know, some people, the way that they talk, they've had the whatever vice. I've been an alcoholic from the womb. I've been whatever it is. I got news for you. As soon as you die, you are free from that bondage. Don't think so. Think of someone in the grave. I've used this one so many times. I'm sure you guys are sick of this. But my uncle, when he died, my great uncle, we went back to Detroit, Michigan, where they had an open casket funeral. They called it awake. I don't know why they call it awake, because he was not awake. <laughs> he was asleep, but like permanent sleep. He's dead in the coffin. <laughs> they had it open in the living room. I was a little boy. I was curious. I've told this before, but I went up. This is my great uncle who had a really hot temper, Sicilian, okay? Chain smoker, drinker. This was him his whole life, like this. I got to free my hands up. My wife says I can't talk without my hands anyway. So this is, this is him. <laughs> as soon as his cigarette gets to the bottom, this is the kind without those filters, the camel, you know. This, then another one, you know, like, and then relight the next one, and they keep going, you know, all day long. And then, and then the other hand is doing this. Drink, smoke, drink, smoke. Oh, it's like, and we were told, shh, when you're around Sio, he doesn't like kids. You're to be seen and not heard. Don't say a word. And they meant it. He had a short fuse, a minute, real Sicilian fuse. And they just like, don't, don't say nothing. You just be quiet, walk out of the room. He just, he has a really short temper. And so our whole life, we we're afraid of him. Now here he is dead. 
laying in the casket in the living room. And people are coming over, bringing food, and everyone's, oh, isn't it a shame? Look at him. He looks so peaceful. And I joke because we're raised Italian Roman Catholic, so he had a rosary in his hand in the casket. They put a rosary with, I was like, that's the first time I've ever seen him holding a rosary. Because before it was a cigarette and a, and a drink. I don't ever remember him praying the rosary. My nonna prayed the rosary. He, not him. You know, at least I never saw it, you know. His hands were too busy to do the rosary. But see, now that he's dead and he's holding the rosary, I'm like thinking, first of all, I wonder what a dead person feels like. <laughs> uh, come on, cut me some slack. I think I was about 10 or 11, okay? I crawled up. when I waited till the, the gnocchi got there. That's a homemade pasta we... Take the thumb and go like this and make these little shells and make this uh, pasta, you know. So really good. But I, I, got, I, I, I repent. I'm not going to talk about food right now because it's before lunch. And then, then I start thinking about I cannot think about nothing else. So back to the story. The pasta came, okay, the lasagna, the gnocchi. They go into the ki They come in the living room. Oh, 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 look, he's so peaceful. And then they go. And this is an Italian thing. They go in the kitchen now to come console themselves with a big plate of food. And you hear all this laughing and, you know, stories going on in the kitchen. But the living room is only for somberness. No joking in the living room. But if you go in the kitchen, it's life. Food and happy, you know. So they all go in there and I sneak into the living room and no one's in there. And I think, now's my chance. So I hang on the side of the thing and I chin up over the, the casket. Now, he's a big boy, so don't worry. I didn't tip him over. Just in case you were thinking it was, that that's not what happened. But I, but I got up on the edge and I looked at him and I poked him. Because I just wanted to see, like, you know. And it was weird. Okay, this is Detroit, Michigan in the winter. I don't know if any of you have ever been back east like that in the area, but it's... They only keep the house. We were from Arizona. We were freezing in the house. We were like, they're telling us that, you know, they have the heat on. And I'm like, there's no heat in here, <laughs> you know. And so I poke him and he's cold like an ice cube. You know, I didn't think as a boy, you know, like dead person, no, no circulation, you know. He's, he's like, a and his skin was hard. Weird feeling, like, like, like it was like, ding, 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 you know, like poking on a, uh, it wasn't like soft. Connie's laughing, she's a mortician, she knows all this stuff. <laughs> she's just looking at me like, you're so silly. Okay, I was young, I didn't know that. They get all stiff, like totally stiff, like a rock. And you know, for this guy who had such a short fuse, I, uh, this is how God taught me this verse of the Bible. When a man dies, he becomes freed from his sin. As soon as I read that verse, God reminded me of my youth when I poked my uncle. And, and he just spoke to me real simply. He said, so what did your uncle do when you poked him? And I was thinking, that's a dumb question. Because no, it's not. I'm reading Romans 6. God's Spirit just teaching me something. You know, God can teach us stuff. He, what did he do? I'm like, nothing. He's dead. But didn't he have a short fuse? Didn't he, you had to stay out of the room when he was around, right? You couldn't go around and, and, and oh, was he smoking? I'm like, no, Lord, he was dead. Did you see him drinking? What, what if you poured him a drink? And literally in that moment, as a new Christian, God taught me the truth of this verse of the Bible that when you have died, you are freed from sin because you're dead. You're dead to it. Now, us older believers need to remember this. Do you not know, you, the all that raised your hands, that are been baptized into Christ, that you have been baptized into his death first? That means you have died. If I would have poured a drink for my uncle, my great uncle, and put it to his lips in the casket, would he have drank it? If I would have put a cigarette to his mouth, here, here's a lit cigarette, go ahead. Take a puff. This is the great uncle who almost burnt the house down numerous times because he would smoke from the moment he woke up and he would smoke in bed and he almost literally burnt 
my aunt to death a couple of times. She woke up with the bed on fire because he fall asleep with a cigarette in his hand and his hand would go like that and light the covers on fire. And they would, the family would plead with him, please, you got to stop for the sake of your family. You're going to burn the, their house, their bedroom was in the up, you know, they have those two-story houses back east. The, their, their bedroom was upstairs. You're going to kill everybody starting with the top floor and then the fire will come down and, and consume her. You, they pleaded with him. He would not stop. He couldn't get free from this thing because he didn't know what we can learn right here in the Bible. That if we join ourselves to Jesus in, his, in, in the waters of baptism, you are joining him in his death so that you get to die now. And what happens when you die, the coolest thing about this is all the mistakes of the past, guess what? They're gone. It's like clean slate, wipe clean, let's start. And you know, this is really important because for a lot of you, you've gone through some hard things. And Christ wants to free you. And the world will keep you in bondage to your past. I say, you made mistakes. You can't possibly go on with Christ. I mean, look at the mistakes. Look at, look at the crummy life you led. Look, look at the problems you have. But our answer is, I died to that. I was buried, my old nature got buried in the waters of baptism. And I've now been resurrected to walk, what Paul says, in newness of life. Now it's about having a new, anyone here for newness of life? Are you up for that? This is what we're talking about. This is the good news of the cross. That we have newness of life. And Paul is telling them, this is, you know, I didn't come to baptize, I came to preach the cross to you. The cross is the power. It's the power of God to salvation. Look at the next verse. I'm sorry, back to 1 Corinthians. He says in, in, in verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us that are being saved, it's the power of God. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.